We've got the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, who actually turned down a cookie. I morning. did turn down a cookie. Yeah. But he didn't turn down two, so he's got uh, one in each hand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have one before I leave. I think so. Yes, you will. Uh, because those cookies were brought in by Laura Sutton, who's running for judge. Laura, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, where do these cookies come from? Um, I told the, the sweet shop down in Shepherdstown. I told them oh. I would give a shout out to them. And the young lady who um, picked them all out for me assured me that if these can't win you over, nothing can. Uh, oh, so. they've, they've <laughs> done the job. Uh, and then some. I, I used to get, they used to bake a seven grain bread down there, which was just I that. amazing. Oh, I don't know yeah. if they still do or not. I haven't stopped in in a while. Yeah, I uh, get hung up on the chicken salad, and then I get an, an eclair. Yeah, well, that's a good combo right <laughs> there. My... Yeah. Let's see, there's bread or there's <laughs> sweets, yeah. okay? Yeah. so Well, the chicken's healthy. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. It's a good counterbalance you know, you to the eclair. You chicken between two cookies, you well, know? It's, it's in a yes. croissant, which yeah. makes it you Make worse. a cookie chicken sandwich mm -hmm. or two eclairs. Yeah, Just yeah, stuff yeah, the eclair yeah. with the cookie. Well, that's it. You got all your eggs covered there. Uh, Laura, you're running for, uh, it is Division 4? Division 4 Family Court Judge. Division 4 Family Court Judge. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the Laura Sutton background that got you to this point. Um, I graduated, actually, I, do you want the whole story? Sure, yeah. I was born in Wheeling. I mean, don't start at birth or anything. <laughs> well, I was going to start with <laughs> well, birth. Start, well, start, yeah, we, no, I was we, born in Wheeling and then raised in uh, Charleston, but I have called Martinsburg home my entire adult life. Um, I went to WVU for undergrad and graduated in 1992, and um, I graduated from WVU College of Law in 1995. 95, okay. And, and what type of law have you mostly practiced? Um, most of the time, I have been um, an education lawyer as general counsel to the Berkeley County Board of Education for over 20 years, and then um, uh, for the Jefferson County Board of Education for about two years. And... Um, but as general counsel, it's almost like a general practitioner. You know, one day I'm doing contract law. The next day I'm doing special education law. Um, the next day we're doing finance things and taxation. And um, I was mm -hmm. also an assistant superintendent and oversaw transportation and human resources, uh, which, food service. Which system? <laughs> uh, Berkeley. Berkeley? Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Uh, how do you suppose you settled in this uh, branch of the law? Um well, right now, my, cur my current job is I'm a child advocate attorney for the West Virginia Bureau for Child Support Enforcement. Mm -hmm. And that's what really piqued my interest, that I learned that the background that I had from um, my work with boards of education fit perfectly into a family court judge. Sure. Because I know children, I know families, especially families um, here in the panhandle. I know what their uh, needs are. I understand... Um, particularly students with special needs and how that can impact families and increase divorce rates. Um, and I feel like I can take that proactive approach from the bench um, and, and help families. What's been your experience uh, going through the court system with these cases? Um, with the uh, child, child support. Child advocate, child support. Um, it's been a wonderful experience because um, what I have learned is that um, it's crucial that children have the financial uh, support that they need from, you know, parents or from the state of West Virginia or whatever the case may be. And what we do is we try to um, ensure uh, that the amount of child support is appropriate and that the, um, the parent, the non-custodial parent is paying uh, their child support on time. But we also are very reasonable with the non-custodial parent. You know, if they're out of work, if they're having trouble finding a job, what I like to do is help them <clears throat> find a job. I'll have <clears throat> them contact uh, Workforce West Virginia. I'll have them contact No Closed Doors. And then by the next hearing, they need to have, have shown the judge what they have done to try to get a job. Um, but during that time, you know, we'll either lower the amount of support or what we call a zero order for two or three months to allow them to get their lives together. You know, we've had cases where <clears throat> there was one uh, non-custodial parent and we were having trouble finding him. And as it turned out, sadly, he was living under a bridge in Morgantown. Mm -hmm. And when he finally did appear in court, he had entered a rehab facility and um, he 
we had given him the information for No Closed Doors, and he was um, working on getting his life together. And I'm really pleased that, you know, we usually come back to court every two months or so, and he's doing well, he's taking care of his kids, he's getting to see his kids. And, you know, that's one success story that I'm, I'm really proud of. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. yeah. Is this a newly created judicial position? Yes, this is the newly created position. Okay, very good. Bill? Yeah, uh, for clarification, uh, uh, on the judicial side, we circuit judges, we have no contested race of the circuits. On the magistrates, uh, we have two contested races. On the family court judge, there is at least two contested races, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And who, who are they? Um, Division one is David Camaletti and um, Christine Glover. Now, does that one extend, cover both Berkeley and Jefferson? That's Berkeley and okay. Jefferson Okay, now go ahead, I'm sorry. And then Judge Matchett, and she's unopposed, and Judge Stevens, and he's unopposed. And then um, my opponent is Carmela uh, Cesare. Mm -hmm. yes, now, have you worked with, uh, worked with any of these before? Any of uh, the the uh, the family court judges? I know you've appeared before them, but other than appearing before them. For example, have you worked with Cesare at all? No. I never have. Okay, no. fine. Yeah. Now, uh, your experience is as an, as an advocate. You have not actually served as an elected official before, have you? No, I've okay, never been elected so, so. And what do you think is the biggest challenge uh, with a family court judge that we have? I think, you know, being a family court judge is very different than being a, <clears throat> a, a criminal attorney or a, a, even a circuit court judge to some extent. Because in those cases, typically the parties don't know one another. Um, typically, they look back at the facts and assign blame, um, either monetary or prison or you know whatever the case may be. And with family court, you get there and the parties obviously know one another, and there's very sensitive uh, information involved with dealing with their children and their finances, the most intimate aspects of their life. And what the judge's job to do in family court is to look at the facts, just as you would do in a, a civil or criminal case. But then you have to make your best educated guess, so to speak, as to um, what will happen in the future and what's the best interest of the children. And you know, then assign custody and, and things like that from there. And I think that's where my background really helps because I know children and I know uh, uh, families and what they need so I feel like you know whenever I make a decision I want to have the best the most information I can possibly get to make the best decision I can and without a crystal ball uh, having the, the knowledge that I have I feel like I'm in the best position to be able to do what's right for kids. Mr. Cram. You mentioned the story about the, the man living under the bridge there yes. in Morgantown. And I think a lot of folks, when they hear family court, they're thinking divorce and, mm -hmm. and you know, that's for top of mind. But it sounds like there's an aspect as well where you're working with the families uh, on an ongoing basis. Is that is that the case? Did I understand you correctly? Typically, in a lot of cases, yes. Uh -huh. um, typically, um, families may come back to court for custody issues or for child support modifications. Um, you know, the the first divorce hearing is just you know the beginning of it, and then it's it's it seems to me, at least my experience is that there's kind of an ongoing relationship <laughs> between the court and uh, the parties because normally, you know, hopefully everything works out well and everybody gets along, you know, until the kids are 18. But uh, m many times, unfortunately, that's that's not the case, but also things change. And, you know, the family court is uh, a place where we can address those changes and work with families. When you mention things change, you're talking about perhaps the, the approach of the individuals, how they're responding to things. Right, within the family. You know, mm -hmm. maybe daughter moved in with dad and she'd been living with mm -hmm. mom. So that's going to change the custody di dynamics and it's also going to change where the child support goes. Um, and uh, I think that's what the main uh, point is there. <laughs> now, obviously, uh, there's there's additional seats that are being created. There's been that with the uh, circuit court judge and so forth. Is this due to, to the sheer volume of cases that, that are happening in the panhandle? Um, I, I believe it's the volume of the cases that are happening. And, you know, we talk at work a lot about, you know, this, this is where the children are. And typically most divorces involve children, or at least when you get into these long-term contested cases and 
Um, yes, so it is based on growth and the number of cases on the docket that are being filed. Laura, for clarification, and I, like a lot of folks, get confused upon the, uh, the various courts in the area and the jurisdiction of one over the other. Child Protective Services, for example, I know they, uh, some of our circuit judges have been involved with that. Does that also include the family court judge? Um, no, abuse and neglect cases, and you know those are all in circuit court. All in circuit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if uh, you, your your particular uh, district uh, is it, will you be cited? Will you spend your time in Berkeley County or Jefferson County, um, or, it, or do you uh, bounce back and forth? I think I would wait and hear what the Supreme Court or what the Chief Judge yeah, okay, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, where the need is, yeah. and I think work back and forth between both sure, counties. Sure, sure. So you so. have a you'd send, you have a bench in both places. Exactly. Okay. That's my that's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. Laura Sutton is our guest candidate for judge. Uh, Laura, there was an incident in which some Social Security numbers were released in the Jefferson County School situation when they were requesting some information on salaries or something. And it was said that you might have been responsible for the release of that information to a reporter accidentally. Is, is that correct? Um, with that incident, um, typically I can't talk about my rep representation with another um, with, with a client. Mm -hmm. However, it was um, a data breach that came from uh, it came from a spreadsheet and, and um, Excel. Mm -hmm. And the second page of Excel that um, I uh, ended up, when I forwarded it in response to a FOIA request, it did include um, Social Security numbers. And just like any data breach that happened with hospitals, with other county boards of education, we took, you know, the superintendent took and Hans Vogel took immediate steps to remedy that. Mm -hmm. They... Um, uh, we gave credit protection to all of the employees. We notified them. You know, I know Berkeley County had a similar incident last year because I was a, an employee there and I got the notification that all of my banking information had been um, compromised. It's happened to me many times. Yes. So it, those things happen. And, um, you know, it, it was unfortunate. And fortunately, I believe uh, it was with the spirit of Jefferson, Tim Cook was very cooperative and he assured me that uh, they had not released any um, social security numbers and you know I appreciated his cooperation there so was there anything that you could have done differently in that scenario um you know in hindsight there's always things uh, that you could do differently yes I would have uh, probably made sure my Excel spreadsheet skills were better mm -hmm. and um, but you know I, I think the way we handled it was any as we would any data breach and you know there's always going to be somebody who opened the email <laughs> that started the virus that shut down the casinos? There's always going to be, you know, somebody who um, makes a mistake. And it wasn't, um, if it's intentional, that's one thing. <laughs> and if it's an error, that's quite another. Um, and yes, it was, um, I, I, I own it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, uh, lesson learned from that is if, let's say, you're on the bench, uh, I don't know if judges have to send out information or if it's their staff that does that, but are the lessons learned from that that you can carry forward? Oh, sure. Um, you know, there's always, uh, f fortunately, as a judge, uh, you don't deal directly <laughs> with the press, but mm -hmm. um, also all of the information, you know, I've, I always double check things. I've been practicing law for 28 years, and, you know, that was one instance in a, a long career of uh, excellent, service um and so yes but of course i've learned from that and um you know i've uh i haven't had any FOIA requests <laughs> in Since. my in my current job mm -hmm. but you know i certainly ha have learned from that this is a is this a six-year term um it's an eight-year term eight-year term mm -hmm. on the bench uh should you win mm -hmm. is, is this something that you'd like to uh, seek a second term on or is, is there uh something else further down the line for you oh no I mean I, I want this job because I want to help people and I want to uh, use the um, the backgrounds that I have to help people and you know hopefully in eight years I'll be 62 which my mom worked till she was 72 mm -hmm. so I hope that uh, you know I would like to serve two terms 
Very good. Is there is there something the state legislature can do from your observations on this side of the bench and your desire to get on the other side of the bench? Is there something the legislature can do to alleviate some of the issues that we have in the court system? Um, like what kind of issues? Well, uh, quicker processing of cases, uh, oh, a sure. backlog of cases and such. Sure. I think, um, you know, I think... What I've learned in special education law, and I, I think it's to some extent there's also it, you know, there are timelines that judges have to have cases moving along and, and off the docket in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And, you know, I think looking at those timelines um, and ensuring that they're followed uh, by the judge and by the um, uh, court staff to make sure that things are moving along because, you know, sometimes in the court where, um, I would typically am over in Hardy County. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the clerk will call me and say, um, you know, the judge needs this, this, and this done. We've got to get it off the docket. And so we work with the court to get those things off quickly. How about uh, with the family cases that are before the court uh, so much in regards to foster care in the state, uh, tracking down of deadbeat parents, uh, a spouse who's not paying their support uh, on time? Um, <laughs> In that regard, you know, the, the legislature, a, a lot of um, child support law, I'm sorry. Sure, take your time. Is coming down from the federal level. Mm -hmm. But um, the legislature has done a really nice job with um, child support and child support enforcement and help giving us the tools we need to track down dead, so-called deadbeat parents. I call them that. You don't have to call yeah. them that. <laughs> Know, I'm, not sure the, I'm not sure the commissioner would like to use sure, that yeah. term, uh, but um, uh, what, you know, we can typically find them, and usually this time of year, uh, you know, we can I intercept tax returns, which doesn't make us very popular with the non-custodial parent, mm -hmm. and we have all kinds of resources to find deadbeat parents, and we can, you know, we typically uh, attach their property, so if they go to sell some land, we can get uh, money that way and get the um, the state paid or the um, custodial parent paid. Yeah, all judges, all judicials, I think would be a very emotional job. Uh, but the family court judge, I think, would be much more emotional than just a regular circuit judge. Uh, the circuit judge, there was an open seat as well. Why did you choose to run for a family court judge as opposed to circuit judge? Well, when I saw that there was going to be an opening, um, family law is what my background is and what my experience is and i felt like i would be an excellent quality candidate for that role i don't believe that my background is suited for um circuit court mm -hmm. and i think you know given everything that i know about um uh, children and um families that family court was the the way that i could serve the public um, in the next role in my life. I've always tried to be useful and tried to help um, society, so to speak, as best I can. And um, family court was the perfect place for me. Mr. Cram. I realize, you know, as a member of the community, I have many, many friends that are judges here locally in the Panhandle, and they always have to uh, dance a very fine line because you may have individuals that you know personally uh, that are, scheduled to come before you what's the process in regards to if you realize you know this is someone you know this this may be a conflict what is the process involved in in i guess changing switching judges so to speak um you know there's a process where um you know when you've sat in that seat as a party um the judge will say you know i know mr so-and-so i know mrs so-and-so i don't believe that that I would have a, a, a problem coming to a, a fair uh, decision. However, you can, um, you know, ask me to recuse myself, and I will recuse myself from that case. And I have no problem doing that. Um, in other cases, you could just say, um, you know, I, I used to work closely with this person, or we owned a law firm together. Um, then you would automatically be recused in those cases would automatically go to judge matchett or judge stevens or judge mm -hmm. camilletti okay so then you you can cross over so as you say you might find yourself uh in in the other county versus in, in hearing a case yeah in, sometimes in you know county. with me because you know my career um hasn't taken me into the 
trial court level and other attorneys. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not uh, part of that club, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I think that benefits me because there would be very few con conflicts with mm -hmm. you know, knowing the, the local bar very well. I'm going to read a comment from one of our Facebook viewers, William Whittington. I don't know if you have any answers for this one or not, but uh, I'm not sure if this is up your alley here. Non-custodial parents have no control over how their support is spent by the custodial parent. The custodial parent has no accountability or audit expectation of how they spend the money. If the parents were still married, there would be joint control. It's a joke and always has been. I watched many a young airman, 99% males, suffer under the child support formula. Their financial world is turned upside down while the custodial parents continue to enjoy their financial lifestyle. Any accountability on the custodial parent as to spending the money appropriately? Um, and, and we hear this a lot in court, and the, the there is nothing in the law that shows or that tells um, you know, that, that there has to be receipts of clothes bought or food bought. Um, and unless the parent or the non-custodial parent can prove waste, you know, that she's at the track every weekend spending the money or she just bought a new truck, but the kids don't have food, um, you know, the judge would definitely take that kind of thing in, into consideration. But, um, no, there's nothing in uh, legislation that would allow um, the court other than in cases of fraud or so the option for the non-custodial parent would be to try to get the case taken before the judge? Um, Is that the option? Really? Well, the only thing realistically? Um, it puts me in a difficult position because I can't give legal advice and I also can't discuss how I would rule uh, on one case well, or another. If you could maybe just strict to the legal way that it would go with, through the courts, there's yeah. no opinion involved. Okay. Yeah. No, it, the, from the legal process, yes, they would go back before the judge and you would ask for a modification of child support. And many parents in, um, in um, family court are not represented by attorneys. You know, attorneys are expensive already and they've sure. got, um, you know, a lot of money tied up. And so the circuit court and when the family court does a nice job of having forms available. Um, so parents can fill out the modification forms um, on their own and um, then get a hearing before the judge in, in a pretty timely manner. So w without an attorney, what's the process by which I would go before, let's say you're the judge mm -hmm. and I'd like to get this uh, support payment modified because I don't think my former spouse is spending the money on my child like they should be. Uh, instead, they're spending it at the track or on who knows what else, but not on my kid. What's the formal formality for me getting in front of you? Um, yeah, th and the same would hold true if, let's say, you had a very high-paying job when you first got divorced, and now your si your situation's changed, there was a layoff, and now you're working, you know, making a lot less money. Mm -hmm. You would go um, to a uh, family court clerk or the circuit clerk and or online, um, and they have forms available uh, for modification and then uh, you fill out the form you can you know handwrite on it or type it whatever you want to do and then you give it to the clerk and then it gets on the, the court's docket got it Final and then you have a hearing before the judge and you say you know <laughs> judge my job I got laid off and now this this wouldn't go in front of the magistrate because magistrates handle a lot of family uh, court situations this would go right in front of the judge yeah magistrates with family court they handle um, Domestic violence cases, yeah, but this would go straight before the family court judge. Family court, and would the judge rule that at that moment, at the, at the end of the presentation of the information? Um, it probably depends on the case. I've seen judges do it both ways. Sometimes they'll ask for, um, you know, some time to consider it, to look back through the record, and uh, many times they'll just decide right there. Have you been involved in these situations for a modification of payment and whatever? Sure, that's what I do every. I have a, almost 100 hearings a month. That's what I do a lot. Is a, lot, a, of a lot of modifications. We do downward modifications or upward modifications. Let's say you got a, a super great high paying job, then uh, the custodial parent may bring us to court to increase your child support. But do you see many cases where somebody's questioning how the money is being spent by the custodial parent? Yes. <laughs> and in those cases, what the judge or what I've seen is that unless the, uh, you know, unless there's some kind of extreme circumstances, there's nothing requiring receipts or things like that, with the exception of medical bills. And but the like burden that. would be on me as the non-custodial parent to prove that the custodial parent is not spending the money appropriately? In, in, the, case, in the court cases that I've seen, um, that is what um, typically the, the 
happens. We've got about a minute and a half left. Go ahead and tell our audience why they should vote for you for this position. Um, I think that I am uh, the most, well, I don't want to use the word qualified because we're all qualified, but I think my background and my experience um, with children and families, you know, my dedication uh, to the families here in the Eastern Panhandle, um, you know, I've been a public servant my whole life, and I think this is the best way that I can use the knowledge that I have and what I've learned in family court and what I've learned from um my prior career um i think it's the best way moving forward for our family court just to have someone who has empathy someone who um has sat in that seat and understands how people feel and um understands what's at stake and i certainly have that empathy going in and i have the experience and the temperament um to be an excellent family court judge Laura Sutton, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. Enjoy the cookies. Well, we will.